about 50% of people will end up having lymph gland invasion. What that means is that the tumor develops the ability to metastasize, get into the lymphatic system, and spread to the, to the lymph glands. Now, this cartoon shows some lymph glands in the center portion of the chest around the, the, the windpipe, but you've got lymph glands in a lot of other places as well that are not shown here. And one knows uh, really uh, refers to involvement of the, of the lymph glands closer to the lung, whereas N2 nodes invo denotes involvement of lymph glands that are further away from the lung. And as I, as I showed you before, just like any other cancer, mesothelioma can spread to other organs. This, sh this shows a, a couple of tumors that have spread to, the, to involve the liver, but it can, it can go to many other places. I'm not going to spend too much time on the stage descriptors. Bottom line is we want to find patients or pick up patients at an earlier stage because they have a much better chance of, of, of clearing them of their disease rather than at a late stage. So the image on the left as you're looking at it um, is of a, a patient who would, in my mind, be considered inoperable, not somebody I would offer surgery to. Radiographic assessment is exceedingly important. I think you can clearly see that these two patients are different in terms of their disease bulk. The patient uh, number one uh, clearly has fairly early stage disease. Patient number two has, has a significantly more bulky tumor. And we know patients who have bulky tumors, uh, the, the prognosis uh, and, and chance of surgery helping them is, is much less than earlier stage patients. Everybody gets a CAT scan. It's a very, very important to, to get a good um, assessment or, or roadmap, if you like, of the extent of the tumor. And again, these, this is a CT scan uh, um, taken from those patients that I showed you previously who just had chest x-rays. And again, I think you can see that, that the patient number two has a significantly more bulky disease than the other patient. We now use PET scanning routinely on, on patients. PET scanning is exceedingly important to rule out cancer spreading to other places. Now, the thing about a PET scan is that you really need a sizable clump of tumor cells, probably about the size of my fingernail, for it to be visible on a PET scan. So it's not going to pick up that small little diaphragmatic stuff. It's not going to pick up one or two cells scattered someplace else. But it, will pick, it should usually pick up a, a, a larger tumor nodule. We know from studies that have been performed at Memorial Sloan Kettering that, that um, they looked at a group of patients who were considered to be potentially surgical. They found about 10% of them ended up having metastatic disease elsewhere that was only found at PET scanning. Uh, we looked at a similar group of patients, and we found that, that PET CT scan, in our experience, actually picked up 24% of patients who had tumor elsewhere that was not picked up by other methods. And I'll show you a couple of examples. So this is a patient, and you can see clearly that he's got this tumor that's lighting up in his left chest. But what we didn't know from his CAT scans was that he had a, a nodule here in his right shoulder that lit up. And that was biopsy, and that was found to be a cult metastatic tumor. This is another patient who had a left-sided mesothelioma found to have a nodule in their adrenal gland, metastatic disease. And another patient who was found to have an isolated bone and um, peritoneal metastasis. So in terms of staging patients with, with x-ray techniques, we use a chest x-ray. Everybody gets a CAT scan of their chest and abdomen, and everybody gets a PET scan as well. I'm not routinely performing MRIs of the chest, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, I will do so in certain occasions if I have a patient who I believe has a, a suspicion of having multiple areas of chest wall involvement. I typically will get an MRI in that, in that situation, but, but it's pretty rare. And bone scans, uh, really, we don't, we don't obtain anymore. So I, I showed you uh, a, an image that looked like this previously. Uh, this is a laparoscopic image of somebody who's got uh, disease in, within their abdominal cavity. It's sort of spread through the diaphragm. And it turns out that in the uh, mid-90s, the Memorial Sloan Kettering crowd looked at the value of laparoscopy um, for staging patients and found that it was beneficial. And so what we have incorporated is we, we do staging that involves not only laparoscopy, but we also try to evaluate the mediastinal lymph glands as well. 
If we find a patient who has mediastinal lymph glands involved, I tend not to offer them the bigger operation of extrapleural pneumonectomy. And this just shows the result of a study that we, we published a, a number of years ago where we, we performed laparoscopy to look at the abdominal cavity and mediastinoscopy to evaluate the, the central lymph glands in the chest. And we found that when we looked inside the abdominal cavity, um, we found that, that, that a small number of patients actually had microscopic tumor cells just floating around in the peritoneal fluid. More worrisome, we found that almost 14% of patients had some reason not to operate on them. Either tumor that had spread through the abdominal cavity, contralateral mediastinal nodes, or, or tumor cells within their abdominal cavity. Nowadays, we've got a new technique to, to biopsy those, those lymph glands. It's called endobronchial ultrasound. This looks like a horrific medieval uh, device, but actually it's, it's about the, the width of a pencil. It's about five millimeters from here to here. And, and what this is, is it's an ultrasound at the end of a bronchoscope. So we're able to now, without making an incision in somebody's neck to biopsy those lymph glands, we can pass this, this device through the windpipe. With the ultrasound, we're able to look through the windpipe at those lymph glands and very carefully put a needle and a direct vision into those lymph glands, suck out some, some lymph node cells, and check to see whether or not there's cancer there or not. And that's, that's shown to be actually more effective by and large than mediastinoscopy, probably because we, we get better sampling of the lymph glands this way. This is on the handout, and if you contact Marilyn or, um, or, or, or David at mesocare.org, uh, I think we can get you uh, some handouts that have this information on it. But this is sort of my, my bottom line workup for patients who have mesothelioma. Generally, patients need to be of good performance status. They need to have non-sarcomatoid disease. Um, and I really shy away now from operating on people who are over 70 years of age just because it's such a big operation. In addition, um, patients have to have adequate pulmonary reserve, their lung has to be adequate to be able to tolerate an operation, and their heart has to be accurate to tolerate, uh, um, adequate to tolerate an operation as well. So they undergo physiologic testing, testing of the heart and the lungs, in addition to the, the x-ray testing. And then if you meet both of those criteria, then we perform the laparoscopy and the peritoneal lavage and the endobronchial ultrasound, et cetera. If we find anything abnormal on those, then typically we just treat patients with chemotherapy. However, if those don't show up metastatic disease or very advanced disease, then patients would be considered a candidate for either extrapleural pneumonectomy or parectomy to cortication. In 1991, the Lung Cancer Study Group, which is no longer around, uh, but was, was headed by uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering crowd, reviewed what we knew at that point about malignant mesothelioma. And they said all forms of treatment, in, in particular the role of surgical resection, remains controversial. Some authors favor supportive care alone, and others advocate aggressive multimodality treatment. At this point, it is unclear what, unclear what treatment might lead to a better survival. Well, again, I think you could almost write the same thing today. Despite many years of doing surgery, we still don't know 100% whether or not surgery actually prolongs life. What we do know is that in the subset of patients who have received surgery and chemotherapy and radiation, that subset of patients appears to have a benefit in terms of, of survival. Most long-term survivors of mesothelioma have had that combination of therapy.